Hello and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, journalist Helen Fospero. This week's guest invented the award-winning Brompton Bicycle, the distinctive small-wheeled folding variety which is so popular in cities. Andrew Ritchie, a Cambridge engineering graduate, was working as a landscape gardener in 1975 when he designed a prototype of the folding bike in his London flat, which overlooks the Brompton Oratory. Fast forward 45 years and Brompton Bicycle is a multi-million pound company, exports all over the world, has won many awards, including the Prince Philip Designers Prize and two Queen's Awards for export. And it's the UK's largest bike manufacturer. And I'm here at the very flat where Andrew came up with the prototype in his bedroom workshop and indeed the name. Andrew, uh, it really is a pleasure to meet you. We sit here in the very place where it all happened, actually in our little woolly hats because it's a bit nippy today, isn't it? Well, it's a nippy flat. It's not, not so much the day outside, but that's the way the order of the flat I live in has no heating particularly. So we have to live, keep it warm somehow. It's a wonderful space and it's amazing to think that this is where it all happened. I think you've been quoted as saying you wanted to create a magic carpet you can put in your pocket. Tell us all about the bike and, and how it all happened. Well, that was the original idea. I used a push bike to get around town simply because it was the quickest way. I did have motorbikes as well. They were fun. But two wheels were far the most predictable way to make an appointment and you could there was much more time in one's life because you could get around knowing exactly how much time you need to allow for a journey. In congested London, bikes are very handy. One you could put in your pocket was sort of something I chatted about rather idly and thought of an inflatable one and this and that. And as you say, I was doing some landscape gardening at the time, which my heart was only half in. I was mechanical engineering was still a, quite a pull. And one of the things that happened was my father, who was working in the financial services world then, met an Australian guy called Bill Ingram, who was trying to raise money for a new project around a guy called Harry Bickerton. He had come up with a push bike that folded quite small, but it was the first attempt to make a truly portable one. There were lots of fold in half ones. They were very much the neglected Cinderella end of the market, and they sort of were in garage forecourts, 35 99 and nobody cared to toss about them. Harry Bickerton had done something and really put his mind to making a bike that you could carry around with you. And Bill Ingram, the Australian, turned up in this flat because my father said, you must meet my son, he's always interested in things like that. And poor old Bill, rather wasting his time, came here. And I saw in the flesh somebody had actually done something about it. This is in the room, just in the hall, I remember it, just when he, he came in, he was demonstrating it to me. And I rode it around. It was a very flimsy affair. It was quite complicated to fold. It was incredibly light, so with the lightness comes all the flimsiness. And Bickerton's got into production eventually, had a, quite a checkered career and Brompton languished on the runway for a very long time. But that's what started it all off. And that evening, having nothing better to do, Bill had gone home. And I thought, well, there must be a better way to make a bike fold up small. And there are lots of formulae for making bikes fold up now, and there are various different models and approaches have appeared over the years. But I simply came up with nothing very clever, but the notion that everything should come to the middle, which is what Brompton does. The front wheel comes in, the back wheel comes in, handlebars come down, and the seat comes down. And so that was what started it, two wheels folding under. The front one now comes around the side. And I sort of got rather hooked on it, I'm afraid. One does. I'm a very sort of obsessive chap. So how did you get started? I had no money. My landscape business, as I say, my business, it was in partnership with a friend. It wasn't really going very far. And as I say, my heart was not really in it. So how do we get this thing started? And a, and a mate of mine, who actually has just been in touch with me very late, recently, from Cambridge days, said, come on, lads, let's have a whip round. I'm sure we can get 100 quid from a dozen people to help Andrew get his prototype off the ground. Which 100 quid was quite a lot in those days. I don't know, but I got knows what, a thousand now or thereabouts. So he succeeded in doing that. So I set to and made some prototypes in my bedroom. My flatmates in those days didn't enjoy all the sort of filings and stuff that started creeping onto the carpet outside and you know, got onto their feet and into the bathroom. So the place was a bit of a mess as a result of my enterprise. I couldn't do it all here. I couldn't do the brazing and the welding to actually make the frames. So I got people, I mean, prepared all the tubes here and made them the right shape so they fitted together, got somebody else to braze them up. And that sort of led to prototype number one. I had very little idea where we wanted to go. The original thing was to find a licensee, get some prototypes made and persuade somebody to pay us a handsome royalty, move on to the next thing. So anyway, prototype number one came and went. It went into a skip, sadly, but everything else has survived. It was really wobbly. I did ride it a, you know, a short distance. And then prototype number two appeared, and I can remember falling over on a steep hill in Berkshire where my parents lived. 
because something let go on it and I really hurt my corners very hard. I hit, hit the deck jolly hard. And that sort of thing really teaches you a lesson. You do not make a product that's unsafe. It just hurts too much and it, and it costs lives and people's you know, ways of life if they hurt themselves badly. So it dawned on me, this has got to be safe as well. Anyway, prototype number one, then number two, a few photographs around that, a little bit of an effort to try and promote it. And I thought, well, with would-be licensees, nothing came of it. Two prototypes, number three came. From each one, they were a little bit better. And I used those, by then, several rounds of this 100-pound whip rounds had taken place. And my poor patient, more friends were running out of patience. That with two prototypes, number three, I really sort of set two and went round all the players. And there were quite a few players in the country then making bikes. I mean, rally which you may not have, your listeners may not necessarily have heard of, but it was well, a tight... I, I had a little rally bike. That was well, my first bike. Well, so me too. Rally, what was it called? Palm Beach. I know, got nicked at Cambridge, sadly, but it was my <laughs> <laughs> my bike of those days. So rally was a, was a titan of the industry. I mean, it really had tentacles everywhere. It had factories in China, steel plants in Nigeria. It was a, a big outfit, but it got rather complacent, I'm afraid, and went the way of all of them in the end when the Taiwanese industry took over. But at the time, they were still quite a big player. And I got very excited because they were. They said, Mr. Richard, this is terrific. We really like it. But of course, it wasn't that far developed. And at the end, they said, well, we don't know what the market size is for this new product. And I think a little bit went on with them, just as it does with us, not invented here. They've got their own design team. And so they've got their own projects. And I do understand that mentality completely. I'm probably very bad at it myself, too. But if, if it's not your project, if it's not your team, it's something that doesn't, it doesn't have so much attraction. Anyway, so it came to Nord. I think by now it was about 1980, because it took a bit of time to make the prototypes, do the design, actually make them happen and get out and find all the suppliers to make it happen. I was an impatient young man and things were going nowhere. And all these promising leads, which made me think I was onto a good thing. So I wasn't going to let it go. But what the hell do we do? As I said, the original founding members who put money into it were not going to back Andrew to start getting into production because A, I'm not the sort of buccaneering entrepreneur personality. And B, I, what do I know about manufacturing? Nothing. So that, but there was a vault farce on that because there was no alternative. So one of the board members said, well, let's do a whip round, see if we can get some people to buy them in advance. The same as whatever happens now, what's it called, when people put a product on the market. Um, like crowdfunding. Crowd, well, that sort of thing. So it was an early, early crowdfunding. Early crowdfunding. Start. So the deal was, you for 250 quid, which is quite a lot of money for a bike, you lent the money to the company, you got a bike in exchange, which was yours to use for as long as you wanted. And if the business prospered, you got your £250 back. So 30 people bought into this. They all came and collected them from here. I remember <laughs> carrying 30 bikes up the stairs. I was, even though I was young, I got totally tired doing that. <laughs> and they all pedaled off and were happy. And I made, another, I made enough bits for another 20, which were sold commercially, if you like. So those went to real people who had seen the first 30. So we were off, but I had no money, so I needed to raise some money. And there were quite a few sort of government-funded supports going on to get the production underway. And I started batch producing in lots of 100 in a very inefficient way. All the bits of plastic were machined from solid. I had no, no money for tooling. I'm in the space down in Kew where I've been talking about Steve Grove and his partner. I had been working with part-time with some design work with them. And that was where I parked myself and set up a table with a brazer called Patrick, a Scotsman. I sat listening to repeats on Radio 4. We, you suddenly realise, if that's the only, any diet of entertainment you've got, that there are a lot of things to come back again. Um, at putting bikes together and organising suppliers and trying to get people to buy them. And we got some nice publicity and the FT, well, the man became a friend. He had bought one and thought this was the greatest thing and he put How to Spend It column the whole page to my little bike and the FT. So with all that publicity, I didn't have to lift a finger in, in marketing. You know, people sort of caught on to it. It caught people's imagination because it was a bike that in, did its folding bit in quite a cunning way. And it, ooh, people would glance at it and think, wow, that's clever. I remember some in Victoria Station saying, well, that's clever. It must be, it must be Japanese. I wasn't going to put him right, but anyway, let's, <laughs> let, him, let him carry on thinking that. So the Japanese were the people who were known for clever gadgets in those days. So we were on the road, but after four batches and 400 bikes, I rang up, I'd bought some bits for the, or sorry, at the fourth batch, I'd bought some bits for another batch of four, and my supplier of hinges in France, who happened to be a French firm who made hinges for the bike trade or for bikes, said, Andrew, I'm sorry, we've, we've been giving you bin ends up until now, and we've thrown the tooling away, and we've got no more hinges for you. So I was stuck with 100 bits, which I'd spent all this money on, and no hinges. So there's nothing for it but to machine the things from solid, which I had access to a workshop. 
um, and just grind away for two months making hinges, solidly machining, to, in order to make these last hundred bikes. But at that stage, I said, enough is enough. I've got to go and try and raise some money now. Were you actually doing that, Andrew, yourself? Well, I could have got somebody else to do it. I just didn't have the money to go out and spend on whatever it costs per hour, 40 pounds an hour nowadays, for somebody to sit in a machine. Because it was untooled. If it were tooled, it would be a different game. And so I didn't have the money for tooling. As I say, it was all done uh, knife and fork style. So that was that was put the end to that little enterprise. And in many ways, it was a good thing. I shall fess up to this because after a few years of use, they started to break. And I hadn't realized that there was a weak spot in the design. And I must have done about, I sold 400 of them, I must have done about 200 repairs. People were very grateful that I did because they were using the bikes. They were heavy lumps, I may say, because the, the aluminium hadn't really got a toehold in the bike market in those days. So they were not as portable as I'd like them to have been. But I still mended them and the people still used them. But that meant that when finally, finally, we did get the show on the road properly some years later, the, those errors weren't repeated. If I'd had bikes in serious numbers all breaking rather than just those few hundred, I would have, it would have been a real difficulty, especially as they were being exported and pushed around the globe from a fairly early That was stage. a blessing in disguise in a way. Oh, well, all these things that went wrong were clouds with silver linings. I can tell you the masses of stuff went wrong <laughs> along the way. I mean, trying to raise money, for instance, for the next stage, which was me having done that lot, thinking, well, now I've got that under my belt. People will come rally around to support me. And you've, you've built and made, you've made and sold 400 bikes without any effort. But they sort of turned around and said to me, the venture capitalist, Andrew, we like your idea. But you've got no proof of the market there. And B, we don't like the flavour of the bike market because the, the, by the time that started to happen, the bike market was going downhill and the Taiwanese bike market was nascent and taking over. Even, even the Brits, who were quite big players in the bike making game. So it was not, it didn't go down well with them. I had a long time with ICFC. And they were very, quite keen. They had a partner on the Channel Islands who loved the idea. But that went on for about a year. And I was wasting time in a way, waiting for it to happen. It looked like the golden opportunity. So I wasn't wooing any other options at the time. It seemed to be just the right, I like the partners in Jersey. ICFC seemed to be a nice bunch of people. But eventually that came to an end. In the meantime, I was, of course, using what skills I had to keep body and soul together. I had to eat. Um, living in this flat, I was very fortunate because it was virtually for free, because it was very low rent. So I could get away without having to pay out a lot for that. But I still had to feed myself. So I went and got jobs, landscaping, going back to my old things, digging up people's gardens, being a messenger around town. I had an old Morris Minor van left over from the days of the landscape gardening, which I drove around London being a messenger in. Very swiftly, I may say, I had a proper bike in the back, a full-size bike. So when all the other messengers were stuck in Soho traffic, I was whizzing around on my bike from the back of the van, getting twice as much business done as all the rest of them. So it was quite a satisfactory arrangement. And that's a little by the by. Fleet Street Flyers, the firm was called. And they paid jolly well, I may say. <laughs> you worked jolly hard as a messenger. And that was one of a number of different things I did to keep body and soul together. But eventually, one of the guys who had come along to the premises in Kew and had bought, got wind of my bike, through a friend of mine who was boating in the channel and she saw another guy with a folded bike on the deck of his boat and she said to him, oh, you ought to get one of my mate's bikes. And this guy to whom she was talking was one Julian Verica, who won't have heard of particularly. And he came and duly did his bit because he was a gadget conscious chap and bought a bike and loved it. Came back a week later and bought two more. And so it went. He must have bought 15 bikes out of the first 500, 400. And we had become quite matey. And Julian was an extraordinary character. He had a very good mind. He had a, a resoluteness of purpose. He had started his own business in manufacturing, so he understood exactly what the problems were. I said to him, well, I'm rather stuck. I rang him up after we'd been languishing after this first 400. I was trying to raise money. As I said, nothing came of it. And slightly in desperation, I rang two or three of my friends of mine who I knew had been quite entrepreneurial, and he was one of them. He said, well, Andrew, I think we can get some money around this. We get, I'm sure your dad will put something in, your family can put 5,000 in. I, I've got some mates, I'll put 15,000 in. I'm sure we can get to the money. So I'd done a business plan calling for 120,000, really pared down to nothing. And it was really small money for trying to get the thing off the show on the road. And that was sort of what it was. So Julie managed to find 40,000 and to guarantee an overdraft of 40,000. I say we had 80. So I rang up the people who I'd lined up to make the frames on day two, having got this money. They said, Andrew, I'm sorry, things have changed since we were talking to you a few months ago. I've got rid of all the staff who would be able to make the frames for you. Uh, Cause this was in the autom, in the, they'd been supplying the automotive market, which in the Midlands, the black country, which was in decline as well. So all their business was going. A firm that's still around called Hayden Brothers, they were still making bits for bikes. 
But we, and we still indeed bought lots of bits from them to go into our frames. But were they going to make the frames for me? No. Which was, again, a blessing in disguise. I thought, absolutely sod this. You know, I've got to sit down and work and make all the jigs myself, which I duly did. And it took a year. So it delayed things. But the upshot of that was there was one person who really cared like hell about what he was producing. Whereas a subcontractor, for whom it would have been a tenth or less of his turnover, they wouldn't have given it half the attention and TLC that I gave it when I was in business. And so hard work though it was, and twice the effort, and you have to get the staff, and you have to deal with all the things that go wrong, and also learn where the good suppliers are. And that was a long old learning process. They were, I was a tiny customer, and, you know, for them, a batch of 100 of this or 200 of that was just neither here nor there, and they would sort of toss it off and have some trainee do it. And it, so much stuff came through the door that was wrong. So we had to deal with all of that when something was right. Time for opening a bottle of champagne. Not that I could afford it in those days, but you know, it was such a rare event. So bit by bit, we got through all that, made the first bike. And uh, Julian had been very insistent, much more than so than me, on making sure we had a market presence. So we had been to a couple of exhibitions with converted versions of my original 400 bikes, made to look a little bit more like what they would be after the improvements that I had brought in as a result of knowing the problems with the early bikes. And also an altogether different look to the bike. So I sat down and made those. Julian had been insisting, as I say, on making us go to exhibitions. And as a result, on two occasions, we were there. And the, you, if you're there twice, the trade starts to notice you. If you're there once, they'll think, well, there's some people who came and went. And they, they, they tried and got nowhere. So we were there twice, and we had got some interest from people. And the second time around, we won Cyclex exhibition. It was at Olympia. It was all very handy in those days. You had to travel around to other exhibition centers. So that was all jolly good. It lifted our presence, if you like. And as I say, when we finally had production, one or two shops were lined up who were really wanting to go. The, what I was alluding to about the change of the bike, the original 400 I made had quite a distinctive kink in the frame where the main bend is, because that was the only tooling I had available. I had to use whatever the local tube bender had. And I always knew this was a slightly ungainly feature of the bike. So building the curve of the bike involved me getting a bit of straight, solid bar to make the former and pulling on a 17-ton press, of sort of hand, hand press, to bend this bit to the shape that was going to form the mainframe tube of the bike. And I sort of tweaked it a bit and heated it up and pulled like hell and sweated, terrified the thing was going to break. But eventually I got a shape that was near enough the thing, but it's it's never been exactly to drawing. It's just about right and does. And we still make it using the same bit of metal today. So it's sort of, well, it's extraordinary that it lived that long. But that gave the distinctive, fairly gentle shape of the Brompton's bow. So when we went out to the shops, that was fine. First few bikes went out. And with the dealers in the early days, I sort of, they said to me, and Mr. Ritchie, that's all, Andrew, uh, that's jolly nice, but I've got two or three Bickertons I've had in stock for four years. I haven't been able to sell them. I was telling you about Bickerton earlier. And so he was out and about. When I've sold those, I'll buy some of your bikes. So we were up against a serious obstacle there because you know, they, they didn't want to invest in a new portable bike when they had something sitting there for a long time. So Brompton had sort of, it was quite an uphill battle, but we got there. But lots of the dealers were not that enthusiastic, with two or three exceptions. The enthusiastic ones just transformed things. I remember in the early days, we had a dealer in Cambridge who was terrific. They were Jewish. They were closed on Saturday. I mean, who closes a shop on a Saturday? It's sort of mad. But that's the way they, they, they were quite orthodox. But they were such lovely people. And they sold dozens upon dozens of bikes in Cambridge. Our dealer in Oxford, very nice person. But the degree of enthusiasm just wasn't there. It was quite extraordinary. Oxford, just as much demand for pushbacks like that as Cambridge. But whereas we sold a dozen a month, which was serious numbers for us, you know, one a month in Oxford. So it's completely different. It's all down to the enthusiasm of the individual, which started to tell as the business grew. I had some, as we developed the thing and the marketing was no longer an issue, it's sort of, the, I was being pulled forward. I mean, in the early days, the image I have of the business is that I had a little puppy I was dragging beside behind me rather reluctantly. And as it grew, it became, became rather lusty, a bigger dog that was just drawing me reluctant, me reluctantly forward. So it was, you know, there was a demand and an appetite for the product. So I had to grow and deal, deal with things. But I was not, I was quite slow. I think some more, more entrepreneurial people would have been more aggressive in following through. But this, maybe it, my thoroughness paid dividends. Because although I said I'd learned a lot from the first prototypes and they had given some trouble breaking, the new ones I was making, although they conformed to all the standards and I'd bothered with standards this time, were still being used. They were victims of their own success. 
uh, being used the whole time, whereas lots of other folding bikes would just be stuck in the garage and forgotten. The Brompton was so much a useful thing that people engaged with. And they said, Andrew, this has changed my life. It's completely transformed it. So there's lots of enthusiasm coming back for people, but also one or two handlebars breaking. And handle, this is, I think I mentioned to you how I hurt all the corners of my body falling off. It was the handlebars letting go on one of those prototypes. They didn't actually break, but something slipped and it fell to the floor that had caused me to fall. And the last is a really uncomfy thing. I mean, you know, you know, a bike is, you expect it to stay put. And if you're pulling on the handlebars and it breaks and being aluminium, of course, we wanted to save weight and aluminium doesn't do what steel does. Steel, when it lets go, is on the whole fairly gentle and tells you it's about to break. Aluminium just goes snap like that. And so, of course, all these poor people getting no warning. They conform to the standards. So we went round and round the houses trying to put get this right and, and replacing people's handlebars and put sending kits around to make sure it wasn't going to hurt more people. And in a way, that helped a lot. We sent the kits worldwide because by then it was, you know, was, all these things don't happen within a year. They happen when things, there's too much, you know, seven years on. You, you, it's very difficult to know, you know, the, to how to correct things. And of course, I didn't want to, anybody to get hurt. I didn't want to kill the business because I put so much into it. It didn't deserve to die just for this one thing. So we had to take steps to do it and we dealt with it in a way that was not that expensive. We didn't have to bring all the bikes back. As I say, we sent out a kit which reinforced the handlebars. And it, it was a magic. The, the, the problem just disappeared, um, which was a very, very good news indeed for us. So we moved on from that. And I now can sleep easier because I don't think the bikes do break. They're pretty solid now. Uh, but having said solid, I mean, we haven't had much weight. We just changed the joint designs. That was all me sort of getting on with new brazing techniques as I learned when how things actually held together. It's extraordinary. But moving into the, into the railway arch, I was felt jolly intimidated. Suddenly there I was with the responsibility of Julian's money behind me and other backers who'd put rather more serious sums than the 100 quid that I mentioned earlier. So to get that 40 odd grand, 45 grand of equity money um, and the Julian's loan. Julian's loan, by the way, it didn't, wasn't enough. So he lent us another 10,000, but it was going really well. And from day one, everybody paid their, not their things on time. And that loan was back in Julian's bank in a year. So the company was sort of straight away prospering because people liked it. It was all because it was something that caught their imagination. I was full of trepidation walking into this, you know, setting up this new thing, getting in at seven o'clock. I was a fairly lazy starter, being there to be recruiting people. The first guy I had was pretty decent, but along the way, I got some pretty rough diamonds who were no end of trouble. So we weren't established. We had no name. I just, and I was learning lots of people how people think they know how to do it. We all make mistakes. I certainly did, but I didn't really know what I was doing. So building up the team, yes, there were a few diamonds who came, a few real gems who were really loyal supporters and who allowed me to start delegating a bit and let them take decisions from others who were a little bit rather rough-edged and there were some hard, tough times to keep them in line. Anyway, because the business had this impetus and there was a happy public there, in a way, having awkward or cutted employees was a relatively small problem. And they all pulled, because they all sensed the success, the success of the business, if you like. So it was n never turned into a major problem having recalcitrant employees. And a bit by bit, as I say, the team coalesced into being a really good working kit of people. I, I had 70 by the time I fetched, by the time I handed over to Will Butler Adams. He's now taken it forward. He loves lots of people around. He's a much more generous employer than I am. I was keen on the economy and saving money. He's uh, much more keen on having a lot of people dealing with all the different issues. So per, per bike, the labour costs are now much higher than they were, but that's uh, not a big deal. Um, he's changed things. But we, we moved forward with great trepidation into the railway arch, then took the second railway arch. So that was the first thousand square feet, then another thousand. And that all seemed like quite a challenge. But Julian was very keen to milk these things to the, you know, he's good at making sure that it's not, you know, we weren't being over generous with subsidies and money coming in and we were being self-sufficient. So we really worked that to the bone and finally got another intimidatingly big shed. This was now 8,000 square feet in Chiswick. Actually, it's a lovely spot. So we prospered there and uh, the bike, the business grew. And the next step was to move to a yeah, bigger business, which was bigger premises, which was a, a big, a bigger shed now, 20,000 square feet in a, an industrial estate just north of Kew Bridge, still in West London, sort of hovering around that neck of the woods. The original railway arch had been in Brentford. And that we moved east into Chiswick and then back west a bit, back into Brentford, which is where we were for quite a long time. And at which stage the company was getting quite mature, quite well known. Uh, we were a bit of a media darling. They loved what was going on. I, again, rather old like Will, I was very careful with the media because the last thing I wanted was a promotion. It overextended our capacity to produce. You don't want unfilled demand. It just means other people come and park their tanks on your lawn. So 
I was quite careful about m- having a measured thing. And journalists ring up and say, can we do something about it? And in the friendliest possible way, say, well, would it be all right if we left it for a year? Because I really can't handle the demand. And they, they, it was perfectly all right. A lot of them forgot about it and didn't come back. But there was always more interest because what Brompton was doing caught people's imagination. And it was changing lots of people's lives. And it was, you know, it was great. How does it feel, Andrew, when you're out and about on a daily basis and you see your beautiful Brompton bike being used by everybody and presumably people walk past you and a lot of people won't realise that you're the inventor. Does it fill you with pride when you think back to those early days in your bedroom here when you were coming up with your prototypes to see how much pleasure and enjoyment people get from your bikes all over the world now? Well, the simple answer is yes. But I I can say more than that. It gives me a lot of pleasure. And some of the things that have the letters of gratefulness and how I've met my wife through it and it's changed my life and I managed to get a job and I was very shy and I've come up, uh, all sorts of curious things have fallen into my intro as letters to the extent that I've come a little bit blasé, but I'm still touched by them. And one, the Japanese go overboard on this and they've two or three books dedicated to Brompton have been produced. And one particular photographic record, which is sort of, and I know you can make books and very cheaply these days and it's all computerized, but it was still very touching to have this little essay of things that's how Brompton was used in all sorts of different ways by this particular individual in Japan with a lovely note penned in the front and all sorts of things. So the touching gestures like that have come along the way. It's such a handy way to get, as I say, get around quickly. You know, you're going to, you're going to be there. It's got this huge convenience. You can just take it with you and without thinking. And that is a, such a plus. When you're riding it, though, Andrew, are you still a Brompton inventor in that you're riding it thinking, oh, I must get this tweaked or I must get that tweaked or oh, here's a new idea? Or do you ride it in the same way as I might ride it? Well, I've stopped getting the new ideas. I did have some ideas for making it a bit smaller. Everything that informed me is, does it work? Does it work? Not what it looks like, not whether it's pretty, not whether it's tactile to touch. Is, does it, will it deliver? And will, you know, when the rain is beating down, is it still going to carry on working? You don't want things you know, letting you down when you really need them. But coming back to your point, do I have other improvements? Well, yes, there are. And it's too heavy, you know. But this, that's a jolly difficult one. Everybody says, well, why do you make it lighter? Well, we are responsible for 40% of the weight, which is the frame. The other 60 is the tires, the chain, the saddle, the brakes, the cables, everything that you just need to make the thing work. Okay, you can make the brakes skimpy and smaller and get a few grams out like that, but then they bust when somebody hits or, or you've got a heavy chap go on it and the tires break. You, you, you can get thinner tube in the tubes, which are lighter, but they lose air more quickly. There's a stop to what you can do. And Will, to his credit, is bringing out or trying to get a super light bike going, which is terrific. I'm very much in favour. Moving into, we use a little bit of titanium. My bike's got titanium on it. He's got an all titanium version, or at least a lot of ways of getting more weight out of the frame. And one or two ways of using quite expensive parts on the bike. So it's going to be a costly affair, but it'll be quite a lot nicer to use. So I'll be, I'll be well up on the waiting list to hope for one of those. As you enter your flat here in Knightsbridge, the first thing that strikes you when you walk into what is now your kitchen, which I gather was your bedroom, mm-hmm. is the beautiful Brompton Oratory. You look out over the Roman Catholic Church, which Brompton, the bikes, took its name from. How did that, you know, how did the name come to you? Was it really obvious because you looked over the oratory or did you think long and hard about what to call it? I did think fairly long and hard. And I had some sort of rather crappy names like Picnic or whatever up my sleeve as a possibility because it was a suggested levity and gaiety and fun. And Brompton had this awful gravitas about it, but it also had a, a, a draw and it sort of it started, it started to be called Brompton and that was it. And it was it didn't, the decision wasn't the one I weighed up for a long time. And I felt a little bit as I say, this gravitas was all wrong. There's a sort of weight about Brompton, which doesn't chime with what the, the bike is meant to be liberating, if you like, which is exactly what I've tried to paint it as. And Brompton has a certain somberness about it, but it doesn't matter. It's, now it's associated with the bike. It's sort of got a bit more of a lift in it. It seems to have stood the test of time, and it doesn't mean the wrong thing in Japanese, doesn't mean the wrong thing in, in Chinese. I wasn't thinking of those things then. <laughs> um, no, I'm sure when you were in your bedroom making the prototypes, you probably weren't thinking of the scale uh, absolutely. that it is now. And what did it feel like, Andrew, when you first got on those early prototypes? I mean, apart from the fact, obviously, safety was of a concern. Was there a sense of pride that you were actually got on the prototype that you'd created and that you'd made? Or was your mind too busy thinking about how it all worked and making it safe? Did you take that moment out to think, wow, remember, this is quite I remember cool. getting the first prototype out and thinking, God, this is a bit of a wobbly thing. But I went to a drinks party at Barons Court, which is three miles away roughly, and made it there and back. 
but it was the ride was ghastly. But of course, you've made it. You put your love into it. I've never done anything like that before. It was the first thing I'd made that you could actually call a bicycle. And I can't remember my emotions particularly on it, but there are some photographs of me somewhere around, just outside here, fiddling around on this bike. But it didn't last long because it was so obviously not going to work as a, as a commercial. It wasn't a viable commercial proposition. So a rethink, getting rid of some of the complexity, it was on the car straight away. So yes, to answer one part of your question. I was thinking already of, you know, this is wrong, that's wrong. But without having done it, I guess, I, I wouldn't have been able to learn what the next step was. And the, all the other prototypes that I mentioned, I threw the first one in a skip. And thank God I did, because it was the most ghastly thing. I didn't really know what I was doing. And I used about and cables, which are thin bits of wire that control brakes, to sort of, as you pull the seat up, these, all these Bowden cables started acting and pulling other bits of frame into position. I thought this was a whizzy idea, because you could just pull one thing and out came the bike. Of course, they all break. I didn't know what I was doing. I hadn't done, I hadn't done the loads properly and little bits of glued up sort of pulleys all broke and fell apart. So it was, a, it was, as I say, I'm jolly glad it's in a skip that nobody's seen this appalling attempt at being an engineer. It um, sort of brings back memories, not that I have any engineering background, but it brings back memories for me as a child with the neighbour's children of making go-karts. And we used to have great fun. We'd make the go-kart and then we'd ride them very fast down our street. And I just wondered that sense of engineering and creating things and making things, was that always there? I had, I had yes. I mean, not, I've never used go-karts, although I'm quite amused to how you, you did it. But the pleasure of being on... I mean, I did fiddle around with... I had my electric train set. I had Meccano. Loved that. I had invented one or two things which didn't work, but I made the prototypes for them. And then I finally got to making a proper thing, which, which was the first thing I made, which you could actually ride on. And we all love wheels. Engineers are suckers for wheels. And, and, and there I was using it. So, of course, there was huge pleasure in doing it. And then the next ones were even better and more pleasure from that. And there's a sort of pleasure now of when I use my Brompton without thinking. It's, it's just, it's, it was my, what I created. Has money and success changed your life at all, Andrew? I mean, you've talked about some very, some very lean times in the early days when you were sort of saving up for parts and, and you know, trying to raise money. Has that made much of a difference to your life? It has. I mean, it's in, insofar as I could afford to buy a house and do one, thing, one or two other things that are not so easy for others. But one of the things that is nice is that you can leave things to the last minute. If you miss your plane, it's not the end of the world. If you have to dig deep into your pocket for a £500 ticket, that sort of luxury means you don't have to worry. You've got more time. You have more time anyway with the Brompton. But there are things like that where your life is affected. The number of times I've not, well, I've never missed a plane. For what it's worth, I can cut it finer without worrying too much. So that being a bit better off is, is in that way is much more comfy. But in the early days, when Brompton started to be a success, I was not interested in the money. I bought a piano, which I could murder various innocent sonatas on, which I still do, but I play very badly. And that was the only luxury I got. Things I now am quite well off. I'm very lucky in that respect. And trying to deploy it in, well, apart from charitable donations, in, in a useful way to create employment which, with some ideas I've got out of my head, which I'm not going to vouchsafe to you, might come to, to pass. It may just be Andrew Ritchie playing around, doing something he rather enjoys doing, which is you know, dealing with a problem. But what I am working on, I think, has got it's back, it's back to two wheels, but this is quite different from Brompton. Now, in fact, nothing to do with Brompton. It won't apply to it. won't work on Brompton. But it might have a market. And if that produces young people in employment and a successful product, the same way as Brompton has done, or older people, whatever, that would be a jolly nice way to sort of hand something back. But it's been, I, I, I sound rather sort of saintly in that respect, but I just started not interested in inquiring things. One, you know, when one's young, one wants things. I, I never really had any of that. So I got through that phase without having the wherewithal to, to get things. And now I've got to be older. You know, if, I want, if a bed breaks, I have to get a new bed. Well, I can, I can buy it. It's not the end of the world. It's not no big deal. But I don't go out and furnish myself with all sorts of fancy cars and things. In fact, I had a very modest car, just... It's all I need. The, the top comes off, I think, into the air, and the Brompton goes in the back. And that's, you know, what else do you want from a car? And do you ride a sort of latest Brompton, or do you have, is, is yours an old favourite? Well, it's, it's, it's an old faithful. I mean, it's, but it's just the same, as I mean, it's the same weight. And I have to, you know, it's, I've changed the chain, I've changed the brake cables, and all the things that wear out in the obvious ways. Um, but it's still the same frame and the same animal as it originally was. And nothing's broken. Are there out. electric ones now? There are indeed. This is Will's pet project, and I have to say, it's jolly nice to ride. As far as I'm concerned, and this is really the Achilles heel of the whole project, but lots of people are buying them. There's a lot of interest. They're selling like hot cakes. I think people do, some have, people have a genuine need to help go on a longer journey. And of course, Gadget Man loves it. So there's always a demand from that sort of thing, something different and new. There will always be a steady, genuine need for it. And it's been, a, but I've never been as 
quite the same enthusiasm as, as Will has had. And it's been an incredibly challenging thing, shoehorning all this electricity into the Brompton, which is very unforgiving, because there's no space for anything, has taken them a long time. And, and I'm not surprised. And there, there was a board on which I was sitting saying, come on, why is it taking so long? And I was saying, it's a bloody difficult project. You, you know, there's masses of sourcing of new technology that we'd never been engaged with before, printed circuit boards and stuff and all the wiring and connections and cabling, which was completely new to Brompton and all of it being sourced from the other end of the world. And I think they've done really well to get as far as they have. And it's really felt a privilege talking to you today. And I feel it's been very nice doing it here in your flat where it all began 40, 45 years ago. And it is 45 now. 45 yeah. years ago. And it will give me a whole different sense when I'm out and about and I spot the Brompton bike, knowing the sort of ups and downs of the journey that you've gone through to get it where it is today. And congratulations. What a wonderful thing to do in life. Well, it's really nice. I'm, I've been jolly lucky. And I have to say that, you know, if the public appetite hadn't been there in the early days... You wouldn't have got anywhere. So I'm, I'm, I've drawn the long straw, if you like, in many ways. It's been a very good life. I'm very glad you have. You've been listening to Andrew Ritchie, MBE, who designed the Brompton Bicycle in the 70s and named it after the Brompton Oratory, which we've uh, been looking out at at Andrew's flat. Thank you very much for your company today. Don't forget to tell your friends and family about the Convex Conversation. We're on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts and on YouTube, or you can download all of our episodes at convex.podbean.com. So bye for now.